quantum mechanics erasing the past. Richard Feynman has said during a discussion of the double slit experiment, I will just take this one experiment which has been designed to contain all the mystery of quantum mechanics to put you up against the paradoxes and mysteries and peculiarities of nature 100%. We have him on video saying that. And it perhaps helps to understand that the double slit and the ghost pathway, which is a variation of the double slit experiment, are basically uh, contain all of the strangeness already. It's just that we don't want to believe it until we try extra special things. And uh, today we're going to talk about one of those extra special things. It's called the quantum eraser. There's a sense in which the double split experiment can be shown to obtain all the uh, contain all the mystery that I'll be showing you today. Uh, it may be more obvious, though, if we look at the so-called quantum eraser experiments. And we will also find that quantum mechanical effects have been specifically designed so that we are not able to communicate faster than light and so that we are not able to reverse causality. That's left to whoever runs the particles. Now, let us refresh our memory on the two-slit experiment and on the ghost pathway experiment, which is a variation, and then look at the quantum eraser experiment. The two-slit experiment is easiest to explain by imagining first light as particles, then light as waves, and then finally light as quantum objects. Now, for light as particles, we're going to have a light source, and we're going to shoot light at two different slits. The light hits the slits. There's a little bit of bouncing around of the particles that you know hit the edges of the slits so that they are not going to be precisely uh, correlated. But um, enough of them go through so that the major uh, points of lights that go through are going to be in the area directly angled out from the light source. And there'll be two, two slits, if, uh, two piles of little objects that we're shooting through there, if that's the case. Uh, more spread out than you might think, especially if you're using a fairly narrow slit, but at least you get some idea of, of uh, what we're talking about. Now, if you have a wave, it has an entirely different effect. And so that you have uh, uh, two wave fronts reaching the slits at about the same time, then they spread out from there, and where they meet in the center, there will be a reinforcement. And right next to it will be an area where they cancel out. Another area of reinforcement, another area of canceling out, another area of reinforcement, and so forth. Depending on how close the slits are together, you may have two, three, five, 300 different uh, overlaps of that kind. That's light as a wave. And a um, gentleman by the name of Young was able to show that light going through two slits has interference and therefore behaves like a wave. Uh, and there's a photo of one particular interference pattern. And you can see there are vertical bars. Um, now again, the particles are not going to do that. The particles are going to have two piles at the most. Maybe one big blurry pile, that would be it. But to have those variations that go up and down, that requires wave action. And it's especially true if you can say, and the wavelength is this, and sure enough, it matches what we see um, in terms of wave action. Now, the ghost pathway experiment is a little bit different in that what you do is have a deliberately split light into two parts and then bring them back together. Um, now, 
if you're doing this with, say, a laser, that's pretty continuous light, and so you will see this effect quite easily. The beam will interfere with itself at the end of the experiment, and so everything gets directed in one direction. If the beam is cut down to only one photon, it still interferes with itself at the second half silver mirror. And you're going to say, well, how do you cut it down to one photon? There are two ways, one of which is to turn it down uh, turn down your light source, put some kind of filters in front of it so that very little light gets through, and then count the light that's going through and notice that, you know, perhaps one every second, or if you've got a computer monitoring it, perhaps one every millisecond gets through, you can pretty much assume that those light particles are all by themselves. Um, but uh, they got even more tricky than that, they have things like a diamond with a nitrogen atom right next to a defect in the crystal, a hole where there should be a carbon atom. And when that happens, uh, an electron is able to jump from the hole to the uh, nitrogen atom and back again. And that allows you to put out one photon of light at a time. You pump it up with a quick laser burst, you wait a second, it sends out the photon. There's only one photon that it can send out. Now, of course, you don't always get that photon. Sometimes it's going in a different direction. But at least you can say there's only one photon coming out at a time. The photon will still interfere with itself at the other end. The question is, does the photon go down one pathway, or does it go down two? So here's what we're going to do. First, we're going to watch it while it's all, let's say we, we cut it down to four per minute, effective rate. When we do that, we're going to get four photons per minute at this counter because the light splits, it comes together, it interferes with itself, and everything goes in the up direction. Now, if you adjust that by a half a wavelength, then you'll get four photons over here and then at the top. But as you can see, um, in either case, you're dealing with something called interference. And in this case, it's very obvious because you, with this setup here, you never get counts at this detector. You only get counts at the, at the one uh, where everything is being sent to. If you shine laser light, you can see the light splitting, going, um, you know, because the laser light is scattered with dust and whatnot, so you can actually see the, the light itself sometimes. And you'll see that all the light that you didn't scatter too much comes together and goes only one direction. But it happens even if there's only one photon at a time. So the photon must have gone both ways because otherwise it couldn't have interfered with itself, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to be sneaky. We're going to take another detector, and we're going to move it in here and see if we can count uh, the photons. And when we do, we don't get four photons. We get two photons. And then at different times, we will get one photon here and one photon here. OK? In other words, we lost the interference. when we did that experiment. But that's with only one photon at a time. So the question I have is, how did the photons that go here know that the pathway they didn't take was blocked? See, there's a theory that, well, it's actually the photon goes down one place or the other, but there's a pilot wave that does the interference. Yeah? But how does the, f the pilot wave know that the, uh, that the pathway that the photon didn't take wasn't available? Because as soon as you take that out, it goes back to um, interference again. And you can put it on the other side, and you get the same result. As soon as you take that one out, it goes back to interference again. It travels down both pathways unless it knows that it can't. 
in which case it only goes down one pathway. Do it again. Same result. Well, we're going to get sneaky. What we're going to do is we're going to take and remove that mirror. As soon as we do, we get two counts in one and two in another. But if we're cutting it down to four per minute, they will not be at the same time. You'll get two counts one way, then in one count one the other way, then two counts one way, then three counts the other way, and it'll average out to be about four per minute or two per minute each way, but not simultaneously. You put the mirror back in, and suddenly it goes back to going both ways. Now, it gets even sneakier. We can take and do this with electrons, although it won't be with mirrors and it won't be quite as clean. You can actually do that. And again, you can cut your electrons down, but this time, we have a sneaky way of doing this. We put a little coil of wire around, and when the electron goes through, it creates a tiny electrical field that can be actually measured. So we know that there's only one electron going down at a time. Besides that, if there were two of them going down, they'd repel each other and go in different directions. Um, and again, this time we won't even block it. We will simply put a little sensor in each pathway. As Soon as we do, we can tell that the electrons go down one pathway or the other, but not both. But we lose the interference. So we think, well, it must have something to do with our sensors, so we unplug the sensors. Now the electrons go down both pathways and produce an interference pattern. You plug one of them in, but not the other. It's enough to destroy the interference. Now, the, if you're doing it with a pilot wave that goes down both, and an electron that goes, chooses one or the other, how does the pilot wave know that the pathway that it that the electron did not go down was being watched. Pilot wave had no effect upon that pathway. But somehow, you lose the interference. Okay, well, physicists are clever and so they try to do all kinds of extra things. And one of the things that they do is they try to take entangled photo photons that is to say, photons that anti-match each other, if you want to call it that, um, which for light, because polarization up and polarization down both register as vertical, they have the same polarization effectively. They, neither one of them has horizontal polarization. So what you're going to do is you're going to send two entangled light photons, one in each direction, and then we're going to check to see what, whether these ones interfere with each other, and then we're going to see whether we have interference on the other side. Now, if you just send them through and you don't say anything, you get a nice interference pattern. But if you, don't, if you send them through and you don't, uh, and you start checking to see which way the one went, the other one's interference pattern will disappear. But you can create a new interference pattern by erasing that information. And uh, this by the way, is, is available on the internet. Um, the paper, and I'm just going to go over this uh, fairly quickly, and then we're going to do our own little delayed choice quantum eraser. 
This paper reports a delayed quantum eraser experiment proposed by Scully and Drill in 1982. And Scully, by the way, was one of the people who uh, was an author of the paper, paper. There are four authors. The experimental results demonstrated that the possibility of simultaneously observing both particle-like and wave-like behavior of a quantum via quantum entanglement. The which path or both path information of a quantum can be erased or marked by its entangled twin even after the registration of the quantum. Now I will tell you that's the optimistic uh, way of looking at it and there's another more prosaic way of looking at it. Um, but it is still very strange. Uh, complementarity, perhaps the most basic principle of quantum mechanics, distinguishes the world of quantum phenomena from the realm of classical physics. Quantum mechanically, one can never expect to measure both precise position and momentum of a quantum at the same time. It is prohibited. It is prohibited by nature, not by some law. We say that the quantum observables position and momentum are complementary because the precise knowledge of the position or the momentum implies that all possible outcomes of measuring the momentum or if you measured the momentum first, the position are equally probable. And furthermore, if you can narrow down the position to a certain range, then the momentum that you thought you had exactly measured has now broadened out. Very small amount, it's a little tiny constant called Planck's constant. Over the years the two slit interference experiment has been emphasized as a good example of the enforcement of complementarity. Feynman discussing the two slit experiment noted that this wave particle dual behavior contains the basic mystery of quantum mechanics. In the two slit experiment the common wisdom is that the position momentum uncertainty relationship, that is the uncertainty in the momentum, pardon me, the uncertainty in the position times the uncertainty in the momentum is equal to or greater than uh, a special form of Planck's constant divided by two, makes it impossible to determine which slit the photon or the electron passes through without at the same time disturbing the photon or electron enough to destroy the interference pattern. It's a problem of our measurement. However, it has been proven that under certain circumstances this common interpretation may not be true. In 1982, Scully and Drill found a way around this position momentum uncertainty obstacle and proposed a quantum eraser to obtain which path or particle-like information without scattering or otherwise introducing large uncontrolled phase factors to disturb the interference. We can do this without having to uh, uh, deal with the p position momentum. To be sure, the interference pattern disappears when which path for information is obtained, but it re reappears when we erase called quantum erasure, the which path information, so that nobody can ever tell again. In 1980, since 1982, quantum eraser behavior has been reported in several experiments. However, the original scheme has not been fully demonstrated. One proposed quantum eraser experiment very close to the 1982 proposal is illustrated in figure one. I'm not going to show you figure one, but I'm going to show you figure two, which is their set up. Okay, now what you have here is a, a, a source of, inf uh, pardon me, of ultraviolet light that goes through two slits. So it could go through the top slit or the bottom slit. This is now I think somewhat familiar to you. I, depending on which slits it goes through, it interacts with a barium borate crystal either here or here. And so now we have two, uh, barium borate is a very interesting compound that allows ultraviolet light to go into it 
and then split into two photons that are going in divergent directions. And uh, those photons will be, uh, depends on, so sometimes it's red and blue, sometimes it's blue and red, sometimes it's green. Um, and in this particular case, we're going to use the green ones uh, because they're both green, they're both basically identical. One of them we're going to shine over to here and then we're going to focus it in on a screen where there's a detector and the detector can be moved. Um, why not have 10 detectors because it's too expensive? I know. Um, but this allows us to plot how many photons are hitting detector what they call D0 at any given time and for any given space. And we're going to see some plots of that. Okay, the second photon comes down into a, a device that diverges the two rays. Instead of focusing them on the same spot, we're going to make them diverge. One of those We'll hit a half silver mirror either here or here. And if it hits the half silver mirror here, half of those photons will bounce off to detector D3 and give a flash. Half of those photons will go through and hit a mirror A, be reflected to another half silvered mirror, which now instead of being a beam splitter becomes a beam combiner and sends the photon either to D1 or to D2. So that if the photons hit D1 you can't tell which way they came. If the photons hit D2 you can't tell which way they came. If the photons hit D3 you can tell which way they came and for completeness, we should probably end, add a D4, although in their experiment they didn't do so, because uh, you would get the same effect as you do with D3. Uh, and then the computer tells, well, when did this one hit? When did these ones hit? And the interesting thing is that um, this entire apparatus can be placed far enough away so that the photons have hit D0 before they hit any of the other counters or even before we have decided that they are going to be split to um, D3 or D1 or D2. And here is the kind of results you get. Okay. Number one, um, this is counter uh, D1. And you will notice that we have what is passively an interference pattern. Now if you're going, well, it doesn't look very good, well, you have to keep in mind that the slits have a finite width, uh, there's going to be some overlap um, and so the interference pattern will not be perfect but it's it's definitely an interference pattern we're going to contrast it to a non-interference pattern in just a minute and you'll see the difference is clear well what happens if you count the photons that go to D0 that match the ones that go to D2 well you also get an interference pattern Although it's interesting that where the D1 pattern has peaks here, the D2 has valleys. And where the D2 has, uh, D1 has valleys, the D2 has peaks. So if you were to add those together, you couldn't tell that there was any interference. The only way you can tell that there's interference is uh, if you separate out the ones that are going to D1 uh, versus the ones that are going to D2. Well, what happens if you look at D3 and 
presumably D4. That's the kind of curve you get, and you can see that there's very little or no interference. Now what happens if you, if you don't measure which ones match D3, uh, pardon me, D1 or D2, and you just lump them all together? Well, what it looks like is an undifferentiated pattern until you start realizing that the ones that go to D1 give you the top pattern and the ones that go to D2 give you the bottom pattern. That is, they're there, but if you're watching D0, you can't tell that the interference pattern is there. It's only when you start correlating it with what happens at the second detector that you realize that there's an interference pattern developing. So, again, D1, D0 is the detector, D1 and D2 uh, erase the which path information, D3, and if you have it, D4, do not erase. And presumably, you could take these mirrors and replace them with full mirrors, and you'd uh, get a non-interference pattern regardless. Or you could take these mirrors and just take them out completely, and everything goes to D1 or D2, and now you have an interference pattern again. To quote their last uh, paragraph, in conclusion, we have realized a quantum eraser experiment of the type proposed in reference three. The experimental results demonstrate the possibility of observing both particle-like and wave-like behavior of a light quantum via quantum mechanical entanglement. The which path or both path information of a quantum can be erased or marked by its entangled twin even after the registration of the quantum. Well, there's a simpler way of explaining it than that, and that is that uh, it goes to D0 randomly, but any ones that are, have the quantum information erased that randomly go to an area where one has a peak and the other has a trough has a tendency to go to D1. And if you pick another area that has a trough on the one and a peak on the other, then it has a tendency to go to D2. Uh, so there is some order that's coming through. It's just that we can't take advantage of it to take mirrors out and in and signal to somebody else who's uh, somewhere else as the interference pattern appears or disappears. So we cannot send uh, messages faster than light. We cannot go back and make those correlations happen. But whatever is making those correlations happen understands the theory of quantum mechanics and is able to make things match. Now, if you choose to believe that photons have brilliant little minds and can see faster than the speed of light what their other photon is, is doing, you can believe that. It's a stretch. It's a little easier to believe that there is a unitary mind that's making the whole thing work and that he is able to make sure that events in one thing follow the laws that he has set, even when we do strange things to them. Now, this is actually something that we can do here with fairly simple equipment. I don't think that uh, this whole setup costs more than about uh, $30. What we can do is we can turn on a, uh, a laser and then move this over just a little bit so that 
I can see what I'm doing here. Now that I'm doing it, for real, it doesn't want to cooperate, but there. Well, I think that this needs to come down a little bit, so I'm going to tighten that just a bit. That makes it go too low. So. And we get it doing it right here. Now that was working better earlier, I apologize. There we are. And if you look at the wall, you can see the kind of bright spot in the middle and then um, uh, some nodes on the sides. Now, I'm going to turn this over. That, that by the way, is uh, two pencil LEDs. Uh, actually, it's three pencil LEDs, one in the middle and then one on either side with black tape on the other side of it. Um, I have to make sure that I've got this the right way because these are, uh, this is not your traditional. Um, I, I looked all over for, uh, for the kind of tape that it we're supposed to have, but um, uh, the kind of uh, Polaroid film, and I couldn't find it, so I finally went down to the uh, local movie theater and got some of their uh, glasses for watching 3D movies. And uh, they're not quite the same as the other ones, but uh, ah, there we are. Now I've got it. Okay. Now let's see if I can get this again. Now what I have done here, um, you'll see some wave-like behavior. Uh, that's actually because of the narrowness of the slit. Um, uh, the, the little dots are not as frequent. And um, uh, now, what I've done on this slit is I have taken one and put it at 45, de uh, pardon me, at 90 degree angle to the other. And so with that, you've destroyed some of the interference. You still have the slit with itself, but you've, you've destroyed some of the smaller stuff. Now, if I put this at 45 degrees, I can make some of those little ones come back again. If I put it at 45 degrees this way, I can make some of them come back again. If I turn it at 90 degrees, I can destroy, I can make it a single slit experiment. Or if I turn it at uh, zero, I can make it a single slit experiment. Uh, but I can make some of those little tiny ones come back depending on how I rotate it. The interesting thing is that, the, that where they come back will be in a slightly different position depending on what I do with it. Now, if you have vertical and horizontal things, you can, you can make it much more obvious than that. But what I'm going to tell you is that uh, you can actually do this at home. You just have to be a little bit inventive. Now, if you look at this, this, by the way, I got from a, a website that I listed here. Uh, you will see where 
the little tiny ones come in. Uh, this is a single slit, which still has its own diffraction, but this is the double slit, which has the little tiny bumps on it. Um, my take on this is that quantum mechanics has particles when they are sent and detected that travel like waves unless you try to figure out their path when they have a definite path and travel like particles. The universe or something in the universe appears to know if we are watching. How does it do that? I will have to tell you that there is not a mechanical explanation. In fact, uh, one of the things I hope to do fairly soon is to explain why quantum mechanics spells the death of the mechanistic universe. Remember classic theological disputes such as does God foreknow and then prepare for our actions? If so, how can we have free choice of what to do? Well, God can cause correlations faster than the speed of light. Um, we haven't discussed that one this time. We did discuss it at another time. It would appear that God can go back in time to prepare for our free choices. Or at least arrange everything so that it looks like uh, he was, had it all figured out to begin with. Perhaps also we are not totally free, and that's probably true. If you think about it, much of the time what we do is deterministic. And in fact, it may be true that when one is in the grip of sin, all that one does is deterministic until God's grace allows one free choice. And in order for God to be moral, all he has to do is fulfill that song, once to every man and nation comes the moment to decide. But then, as I said, we knew that. But perhaps God does not have to finalize the universe until there is an observer. That is, reality is dependent upon consciousness. Perhaps Niels Bohr was right. The moon isn't really there until you look at it, or at least until someone looks at it. God has a consciousness-centered universe. And he prepares, if you like, you could think of it as he has the most incredible um, uh, reality simulator of all time. But that means that he has total control of that reality. Well, why does science work then? Well, because God is dependable. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes. <clears throat> uh, touching on very basic questions here. Uh, as a scientist, of course, I'm uh, enamored with cause and effect. Mm -hmm. And it works, and it seems to work and work and work. Yes, it does. Uh, most of the time, <laughs> except this morning. Uh, uh, on the other hand, I'm faced with the fact that, uh, well, uh, the basic question, one of the basic philosophical questions is, why is there anything instead of nothing? And, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a question that hasn't been answered, of course, yeah. except we know there is something. Obviously, we exist, uh, and uh, so on. How to get started from nothing? And this challenges at least our simple uh, concepts of cause and effect. Mm -hmm. uh, philosophers have claimed that uh, science developed in the Western world, I'm speaking of Whitehead and uh, Hokius and mm -hmm. uh, others, that uh, science developed in the Western world because of the cause and effect of monotheism. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and so we've got a whole universe here that seems to work, but we come to the basic question, um, how come this is anything instead of nothing? Uh, our cause and effect seems to, seems to drop out of the way. And so I, I'm willing to uh, give up. As a scientist, I'm willing to give up the fact that, uh, hey, I can't answer our everything by cause and effect. And then the question is, uh, at which level here are you going to, uh, you've suggested maybe that God uh, interferes here at the quantum level. And, or, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure it interferes <coughs> is the right word. It, it's more like he creates, he, and he has incredible okay. rules for creating, but mm -hmm. they, don't, they don't require the atoms uh, to cooperate as much as they require the one who guides the atoms to cooperate. Uh, so uh, you're, are you suggesting that he made laws that m make quantum mechanics work that we don't understand? I'm suggesting that he didn't <clears throat> make laws that he, ob that he obeys his own laws, so to speak, most of the time. Mm -hmm. I don't know just where to, to draw the line. I mean, I think yeah. quantum, quantum mechanics is an excellent example of, uh, hey, we don't know very much. Yeah. And uh, an excellent example that our, our ordinary cause and effect concept mm -hmm. uh, doesn't work all the time. And that we uh, ought to be a little humble uh, in our search for truth. It has all those good, good effects. To it, but I am not. I'm not sure where to draw the line. Uh, but it is, it is an interesting idea. I still claim that cause and effect usually works. Yes. And that science usually works, and that uh, I better go to work on time and uh, other things. Uh, uh, it's not a good idea of flout, uh, to flout the laws of nature and then pray for God to act to save us. Uh, we need to be very cautious here. That's, uh, I guess, what, what, I, what I'll say here. But this is interesting. Uh, comment over here. Just a minute, we're going to get you the mic. Uh, the most famous uh, critic of the Copenhagen Bohr view, of course, is Albert Einstein, right. who said God doesn't play dice. Right. And so your proposal to find the activity of God in the microscopic world may be creating a God of the gaps issue. That is to say, if some explanation for the mysteries of quantum mechanics is later found, that path of finding God, or at least pointing to uh, stating that there should be an inference of God is subject to later, uh, later criticism and later, um, later discoveries. Well, there, there are two answers to that, okay? And one of them is that if you take that argument to its logical conclusion, you could never propose that God did anything. Because you could always find out it could have been done by nature some way or other. And so what it means is that you will never say, God reached in to touch my life. You know, the person who came by and said, uh, uh, you know, can you take groceries to so-and-so's house? I felt impressed last night that these should go to her house. You walk in and you find out that she's just finished her last meal. Okay. Could be coincidence. In fact, we're going to discuss that particular issue. The fact of the matter is if you really don't want to believe, you don't have to. Uh, well, maybe some things you kind of are forced to. 
But the most important things you're not. You know, this could all be just a plot by God. He really doesn't love us, he just likes jerking us around. See? Or it really isn't God, it's just coincidence. If the stars were to spell out some kind of a message. In some universe, if you have a multiple universes theory, they do. And it's all chance. And it has no meaning. And in fact, this question was put to, uh, uh, I believe it was Lawrence Krauss. And some of you who were here when Sean Pittman made his presentation will remember reading that. What it comes down to is, if you don't want to believe, you don't have to believe. But that seems like a very poor way of making one's decision. Um, because when there are coincidences that are just unbelievably un uh, remarkable, to say, but you know, in some universe it happens, kind of. Uh, well, there are two things it does. One of them is it may be ignoring evidence that's in front of your face. And the second one is that it's, it, it makes any experience totally irrelevant to the question. Because once you've gone that way, you know, but it happened. Um, the, the second problem that I see is that this is not a, a controversy that was uh, being held by the ancients who really didn't understand. This is a controversy that is being pushed on us by the brightest scientific minds of our time, and some of them know it. In fact, most of them understand it. They just don't want to go there. And so this is not a God who's slowly shrinking away. This is a God who has reappeared. Or maybe in this particular case, appeared uh, in a place we didn't expect. So that it is different from the, well, you know, it was lightning is just caused by God instead of lightning is caused by storms. Um, God of the gaps <coughs> is an argument that has no stopping point until you push God completely out of the universe. Furthermore, you have to remember that there's the atheism of the gaps. That is to say, right now we don't understand how quantum mechanics can work with relativity. But someday we'll know. And when we have it figured out, we know it's going to be, it's not going to require God. Yeah. Um, that is as much a promissory statement as the reverse. Um, I, and logically, it <laughs> makes as much sense to say, well, you know, the evidence is pretty strong here. <clears throat> and the more we test it, the stronger it gets. <clears throat> Maybe there is an intelligence that, among other things, has enough sense to understand quantum mechanics and has enough ability to make particles obey those laws. I mean, you're right, and we, we hear that argument all the time. Mm -hmm. But when you really think about it, the argument is, see it my way because eventually we'll win, <coughs> and right now, it's in the face of the evidence. You know, I, I think you can argue, um, Paul, that uh, uh, so far in our investigation of nature, 
we have not reached the level where we think we have understanding. We're just raising more questions than we used to have. And uh, so uh, uh, to think that we're eventually we're going to answer everything uh, has a rather superficial uh, background. Uh, that's not where we're headed right now. Well, it's I worse mean, than that. I mean, if you look at the data that we have on uh, the information that is required for life, or, par uh, or par it is hard enough to squeeze that into evolution. Or particles. Alert. It is virtually impossible to squeeze it into, unless you know mm -hmm. you have a universe where everything that can happen does happen, for no reason. Um, uh, for the origin of life itself, because you don't even have natural selection as a culling agent there. But in, in at the atomic level, Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, they're, they're talking about more and more particles uh, for the atom. You know, uh, I've heard such figures of 50, 60 different subparticles in the atom and so on. Uh, uh, we don't know where we're going yet. Uh, and so uh, uh, to say that uh, we're accomplishing something uh, is probably a little bit superficial. A comment back here. <clears throat> This isn't the first time I've struggled with, uh, as a scientist, <clears throat> trying to decide where the boundary is between observing and measuring. If, if you get what I'm at, is yes. simply observing yeah. a phenomenon and changing it. Yeah. And, uh, and this is the interesting and thing. And then as you, you put you have additional conditions on how you observe it, directions. it changes? You observe one, and suddenly the other one changes. But does this go back to simply observing something changes it? Or if there's this other theory that it's the observer who changes. Well, that's an, that's an, you know, that takes us completely out of the realm of reality and that, uh, or what we usually think of as objective reality. Um, you know, if we were in a simulation, how could we tell? Uh, the fact of the matter is, science works but we can't prove why. And that has actually been true since Newton and it's been true for, um, Einstein finally got rid of the problem of gravitation as a, uh, uh, as, a, as a spooky action at a distance only to find out that he had created a new one because he got his, he got his Nobel Prize not for relativity, actually, but for qu starting quantum mechanics, which uh, must have been uh, ironic to him. The um, universe is basically rational. Uh, the Bible is basically rational. And I think uh, rationality is an extremely important tool. Uh, but I think that there's something beyond it. There's got to be something beyond it because we, we ultimately it runs into a, a blood brick wall. Well, the other question is, uh, is there a rationality that takes into account consciousness? That's one of the basic questions, you know. And, and one of the things that science has usually tried to say is that whether you're observing or not doesn't really matter. But those of you who conducted medical experiments know that observing it does matter. 
That's why we do the placebo effect. And we try to account for that because simply people knowing that they're getting treatment and that the treatment is intended to make them better and maybe it will make them better, will make them better on its own. Mm -hmm. uh, come I in think here and then down here. I think at this point we have the problem and the reason why quantum mechanics and quantum whatever is so difficult to grasp is because we have no idea how to combine information and matter. At present, those are somehow incommensurable. <laughs> They're like totally different realms. The problem is that at the foundation of reality, there must be a connection between information and matter. And when that is found, What will we learn from that? Could it be that we will suddenly conclude with John, in the beginning was the word? Well, experiments like this are arguing that perhaps information is more fundamental than matter in much the same way as we had to learn that energy is more fundamental than matter. That matter can be turned into energy and that energy can be turned into matter. And uh, energy has properties which we usually associate with matter. <coughs> that is to say, something that has energy in it weighs more. Um, it attracts things gravitationally more. I That's weird. I That's true. I suspect that uh, quantum mechanics would have been more acceptable in Plato's time than it is to us now. We're, we're directed towards matter. Uh, I, I think you're right, and uh, eventually we're going to discuss materialism, idealism, the fundamental foundations of them and where quantum mechanics comes with that. And uh, the idealists, I, I think, are quite happy right now. Yes, a statement and then a question. <clears throat> I believe in a creator God and I believe in sin. Uh, as far as that's the statement, the question is, if the world is that rational, what happened to the politicians? <laughs> They're out of this world. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. this is a personal account, and I want to know how science would say it occurred. Christmas morning, several years ago. I got up early, no reason, I just woke up. So I'm sitting out drinking some hot cocoa and looking at my Christmas lights. And in my head was a refrain that went over and over and over, call Peggy, call Peggy. Well, it's Sabbath morning, she's not gonna be up yet, call Peggy. This is not a, 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 a voice, it is the sensation, call Peggy. And it went on and on, and a couple hours went by, and I thought, well, this is more like the time she'll be getting up. When I did call her, she answered, and all I heard was gobbledygook. She had had a stroke. Now, how would science tell me, explain to me, how this tremendous necessity to call her was brought to me and that I could call an ambulance and I could get her in the hospital. Uh, you know, this is, th these kinds of things. What about when I was a very heavy smoker in my 20s and one night I'm on my way home, I just bought a new pack of uh, very expensive uh, 
uh, Winston's or Marlboro's. This is 1972. And I know the exact location. I just all kind of in one movement, opened it up, took one out, put it in my glove box, threw it out the window, looked up and said, please take the desire away. I have not smoked a cigarette since. I have never had the desire to smoke a cigarette since. Now, how does science explain that? Anybody? Well, it depends on what the tools are in science's toolbox. If you rule out the possibility that we can either receive or send communications by any means other than our senses, then it makes it tough. And especially if you say that the rest of the world, uh, God cannot interfere so he can reach even our senses. On the other hand, if your toolbox has a God who can communicate with human intelligence, uh, without having to go through the world, or even a God who can rearrange the world sufficiently to where the human intelligences can be contacted that way, uh, then you can have influences of some kind that God decides to go around the usual routine. But how would an atheist explain to me how would an atheist say to me, well, Allie, I think it, you know, I mean, how would they do it? You, it it's well, I, just, I just told you. It's very simple. There are, there are gazillions of universes, uncounted, <laughs> I mean, literally uncounted, like infinite. No, I know the answer, but I mean, I, mean, I, know, the, I know who was sending this to me. But, I, but in the, the... And in some universe, it was bound to happen. We oh, just I happened see. to live in the universe that it happened. It's coincidence. I told you, if you don't want to believe, you don't have to believe. There is, if I may adjust, there is also the escape that the Pharisees used when Jesus confronted them with a question. They would say, we don't know. <laughs> but I think those two things that happened, simple things that happened in my life is enough to convince me that I don't, I don't even know anything about quantum physics. I don't know mo most of the things that you talk about. I'm in here as a learning thing. And it hasn't made a big Im impression in my life, most of these things, because I believe. I just believe. And, uh, and, and I believe that God wanted me to save this woman from, uh, she was my mother-in-law, a former mother-in-law. And he wanted me to, he, you know, he picked me out of all the people in the world to send this message to. Now see, if God has rules that include consciousness in some way or other, he can do that. Really, methodological atheism is, is saying you must pretend that there is no God. You must think like there is no God. We don't have to prove it, because if you wait long enough, we'll prove it anyway. Mm -hmm. And the evidence looks like it's going in the other direction. Uh, we'll take two more comments, and then uh, we'll continue informally. Um, uh, go ahead back, and then come back to Wes. Just to add something else that's a bit strange. As a neuroscientist, I, I used these results to kick off discussions in class near the end of the class. Uh, there were some experiments that were done very, very carefully. Uh, now, I haven't followed this up, but I followed it at the time to have reason to believe that results were real. Very simple experiments. You take two individuals, put them way away from each other, put EEG electrodes on their head in the right spots, 
when you blink your eye, you get a particular change in the EEG pattern. It's very predictable. If you separate identical twins, one blinks their eye, the probability is fairly high that both will get the EEG change. If they are fraternal, it's less likely, and if they're unrelated or haven't communicated, you don't see it. Interesting, to say the least. Yes, I would say uh, so. Um, also, not generally uh, <coughs> part of the standard scientific armamentarium to explain those. Doesn't make it in, does it? I'm not sure that this comment of mine that will be forthcoming has any relation on what we're really trying to talk about because I don't really know what we're trying to talk about. <laughs> uh, I've heard about quantum theory most of my life and I've had pretty good education and so forth, but I'm afraid I don't quite understand <clears throat> the what quantum, quantum theory is, but it certainly, by the same token, the lack of understanding of it seems to be a very powerful magnet for all kinds of philosophical discussions. Yes. Which, uh, <laughs> amusingly to me, are not, are not related, possibly. That seems to be the theme word of the day, possibly. Uh, but perhaps this uh, is. I, I heard reference to atheists. And the thing that I'm uh, most interested in about atheism at the present moment is that many of them are beginning to suspect and accept spirituality which to me sounds utterly contradictory. An atheist by definition is someone who can't believe in God and therefore any spirits at all. They can't believe in God, but they do believe in spirits apparently nowadays. Now, if anybody has a comment on that, I'll be interested, but I don't expect that you will. It's just that atheists who can't believe in God now believe in spirits. Uh, whether they're believing in the ESP that we just heard the, the gentleman talk about or something else, uh, I don't know because they're having a difficult time explaining what do you mean by spirits that you believe in spirituality? Well, it may be simply the spirits, which is, gets us back into talking about Satan and about God and his angels again. And somehow, again, we're back again talking about a phenomenon in which they can, these people, these entities, can understand before things happen. Uh, where uh, I just came across Sister White's uh, quote again that Satan cannot read your thoughts, but God can. Now, does that involve a quantum, quantum theory? Uh, the quote seems to imply that he is not permitted to. Now what does that mean? That you are permitted to or not permitted to? The disciples were given authority over spirits and yet we're not, but they were. Maybe we are and we just don't know it. <laughs> anyway, come back next week and we'll uh, We'll have some more fun. Sorry. Yes. Well, to answer Brother Kaim's profound question, <laughs> I just read in 1 John chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, I believe, he who hates his brother is blind, walks in darkness. He who loves walks in the light. That's an interesting statement. It turns out that um, 
You know, you've heard the expression, love is blind. I think the person who coined that didn't really love. When you really love, you see things far more than from your own point of view. You actually see things from the point of view of the beloved. If God loves us, including the sparrow, he not only sees the sparrow, he not only sees us, he sees through the eyes of the sparrow all the hopes and dreams and the joys, the sorrows and the fears. What does that mean? That means that God sees reality from every possible perspective. Becoming selfish narrows the field of view dramatically. That's what it means, I want things my way means I want to ignore what anybody else has to say or think or suggest or hope for. That means I am blinding myself. That means I walk in darkness. That means I have voluntarily just narrowed all my options. Now, in what way is that an improvement over a broader field of view. <coughs> the irony is that God's commandments are founded on love God and love your fellow neighbor. And that's what everything that is is based on. And if we discover that great truth, then we've learned something. If we reject it, then we're in the darkness, I'm sorry to say.